And for those of us who take the Bible seriously, but not literally, these stories contain deep and abiding truth, in which the focus is not on the factuality of the stories, but on the truths that they contain. They speak to the obstacles of faith. They proclaim that we also can come to experience the presence of the risen Christ. That the resurrection experience is not simply a once upon a time kind of truth, but rather it is a continuing and abiding truth to this very day. And these stories are told in order to clear away the obstacles of believing that truth and to show us the way. Perhaps the most difficult of the traditions lies in those that surround Mary Magdalene. It is obvious that there was once a very strong and powerful tradition of her prominence among the disciples. But most of that is lost, and we can only recover it by painstakingly working through recently discovered documents. But while the canonical Gospels do not agree on much detail about that first morning, they do have unanimous agreement about these four things concerning Mary Magdalene. One, that she was part of the group that was around Jesus. Two, that she was present at his crucifixion. Three, that she visited Jesus' tomb and found it empty. And four, that she had received a vision either of an angel or of Jesus himself. Now there are additional points of agreement within the Gospels about Mary Magdalene. That she was the first to have a vision, the first to have a vision of the risen Jesus. That's recorded in Matthew and John. That Mary was the first to announce the resurrection, that is, she was commissioned as the Apostle to the Apostles. And that is recorded in Mark and Matthew and John. That much we know about Mary Magdalene from the Scriptures. Then how come most people remember her only as a reformed prostitute. Isn't that strange? That this woman who was the first to go to the tomb, the first to encounter the risen Christ, the first to bear the message to the apostles, is only remembered in these scriptures, according to our recollection, as a reformed prostitute. Well, here's one of the reasons why. According to Luke, by the way, Luke is the only evangelist who does not report Mary having a vision of the risen Christ or of Mary being sent to tell the other disciples about the risen Christ. Luke has this sentence buried in his gospel that Mary Magdalene was the one from whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. Then you leave it up to the patriarchy of the church to tell us that obviously those seven demons were the seven dead in sins. All of them centered around sexuality, of course. And therefore, Mary must have been a prostitute. But that's all the canonical gospels have to say about Mary Magdalene. All the rest is conjecture. And yet she remains the single most important woman of interest in the Gospels, with the possible exception of Mary, the mother of our Lord. Mary Magdalene's notoriety down through the years is not biblical, but rather it is conjecture based upon some very bad theology and perhaps even a deliberate attempt by the male disciples to discredit her role and her place amongst the disciples by characterizing her as a fallen woman. 
So here are some biblical texts that are not about Mary, but often are associated with her by the patriarchs of the church. She is not the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with perfume. She is not the woman who anointed Jesus' head. She is not the unnamed woman uh, in Luke's Gospel who anointed Jesus' feet and wiped uh, with her tears and uh, wiped it with her hair. She is not the Mary of Bethany who sits at Jesus' feet. She is not the woman caught in adultery. She's not the Samaritan woman at the well. Nor, finally, is she the bride of the wedding feast at Cana. And yet, each and every one of those stories are associated with Mary Magdalene by the early church fathers. And so down through the ages, the stereotype of Mary Magdalene as a fallen and redeemed <coughs> prostitute captures the imagination of the church to this very day. Lots of biblical scholars are beginning to say this begins to stink like a cover. <laughs> Obviously, there was a very strong tradition that Mary Magdalene was a close follower of Jesus, that she was at the cross, that she was at the tomb, that she indeed had a vision of the risen Lord, but then she's dropped from the Gospels and finds life only through the mythology of being a fallen and redeemed woman. Yet recent discoveries of extra-canonical material paint a very different picture of Mary. There are at least 12 existing texts which have been recently uncovered that contain information about Mary from which we can create the following profile that Mary is prominent among the followers of Jesus, if not the most prominent, the first among equals. That she plays a leadership role among the disciples. That she is a visionary. That Jesus praises her for her superior <coughs> understanding. That she is identified as an intimate companion of Jesus. That she is opposed by or in open conflict with one or more of the male disciples. Peter, in particular, who seems to be jealous of her. And she is defended in part by some of the other disciples when attacked by Peter. So what's the point of all this? Well, I would suggest to you that if indeed Mary is the first to the tomb, if indeed she is the first to have an appearance of the risen Jesus, if indeed she was commissioned to be an apostle to the apostles, then there is a message that has been downplayed by the church as an institution. And we need to search diligently to try and find out what that message was. I think it was simply this, that Mary was the first and foremost advocate of Jesus' teaching that the kingdom of God was an egalitarian community, that there is no hierarchy, that there is no power, that whoever wants to be first must be last, Whoever wants to be greatest must become the least. Mary understood that and Mary <coughs> proclaimed that. I think Paul probably comes closest <coughs> to capturing what we might call a uh, Magdalenian theology. When Paul says in Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. I would humbly suggest to you today that the Easter message here is this. 
If you want to experience the risen Christ, don't look for him in the systems of the world that are exclusive in nature. If you want to experience the risen Christ, don't look for him in systems that are sexist or racist or nationalistic or militaristic or pick your favoritism and fill in the blank. You won't find him there. In other words, why are you looking for the living among the dead? If you want to meet the risen Christ, you begin looking in places where all are welcome, where all are equal, where all have value, and no one is discounted because of race or color or economics or creed, where all are loved and cared for from the least of them all the way down. Notice the direction, all the way down <laughs> to the greatest. That is Mary's witness. <coughs> Consider a church whose imagination would be focused on that message of equality rather than a church who focuses on her so-called fallen nature, which, by the way, puts women in their proper place. <laughs> Mary's witness, Mary's prominence among the disciples has much to teach us. She remains to this day an apostle who can open our eyes to the risen Lord and help point us on the way. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.